All right, perfect. Um, similar to Adam, I also run innovation in an academic medical center. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about today is how uh, a lot of my work is bypassing the academic medical centers because of the problems of accessing data that John and, and others have, have referred to. Um, we've really focused on applications of data science as it refers to data that exists outside of clinical systems. So this is an, um, uh, an animation of the emergence of Ebola across West Africa. And there's no way that one could produce a map like this, especially let alone in real time, if you're accessing data from clinical records. Just those records don't exist, even if you could. There's no ability to extract them and make those available in real time to support interventions. And our view over time has been, if it's so challenging to access this data, why not just bypass the people that own this information and go right to the individual? And so our view has always been that there's this opportunity with the information that individuals produce in their day-to-day -day lives and their interactions with technology, whether it's through SMS, through interactions on social media, what they search for online, all that information produces very important insights about individuals. Some percentage of those, what we call digital breadcrumbs, relate to health health behaviors, health outcomes. And as we start to organize that information and look at it across multiple different individuals over time, our view is that you can start to get some real insights about population health. And there's been many examples over time that have shown that the insights you can get from this data can tell us early information about epidemics, whether it's infectious disease, chronic disease, health behaviors. And so there's a whole emerging field that's happened over the last decade, which is this concept of digital epidemiology and applying data science, machine learning algorithms to the large types of sort of unstructured data that are amassed in the process of people's interactions with technology. And the reason that we think it's so important, the reason why I think it's relevant to this conversation is that data becomes available not only in real time, but across huge geographies. And so when you can think about identifying important public health signals, not in a particular location like Boston, but at scale across the globe, really important insights can be gleaned. And of course, it doesn't replace the opportunities around clinical data and the opportunities for mining that information, but the opportunity to begin immediately developing public health surveillance systems that can support global public health are clear. And we've been involved in this for, for over a decade now in, in a system called HealthMap, but it's part of an ecosystem of tools that are now used by the WHO as part of their int intelligence gathering operations. And what this does is it taps into the conversations that happen online through patients, clinicians, NGOs that are producing all this insight and essentially bypassing government systems. And we can have a discussion about the value of that and the value of opening that information ahead of governments making that information public. But ultimately, we believe that that increased transparency is supporting public health. And over time, over the years, this area has evolved. There's been a recognition that individuals are not necessarily just data sources, but actually can provide and contribute to public health. And this whole emerging field of participatory surveillance that has come into play, a number of different systems we run one called Flu Near You, which has enabled uh, the actual individual to be part of public health. So we say putting the public back in public health, where tens of thousands of people are contributing information into a global system that are now allowing us to understand influenza epidemics. If you start to think about that going forward, the value for the individual becomes in the insights that they can get back, the targeting of messages that they can, you know, for instance, know about getting the flu shot, but more importantly, the tools that we can provide to those patients take sort of information from academic medical centers like what does it mean to have a fever with associated symptoms. You start to put that information together, you give insights back to patients, but ultimately you get huge amounts of data at, at, at global scales. What's also happened, and there was a mention uh, several times now about wearables, if you think about continuous measurements of vital signs like temperature, all of a sudden now you can build algorithms, decision support tools that link to um, these kind of devices that can give, again, guidance back to individuals, but support real-time surveillance efforts. And this whole field has evolved pretty significantly uh, with the emergence of, of, of chatbot tools that are sort of using the full understanding of medical knowledge and building those into to conversational interfaces, whether they're text or voice-based. There's a number of different companies. We want, work with one that came out of, of the iLab at Harvard called Bowie. But many of them are doing a very similar thing, which is taking as much medical knowledge as possible, building decision support tools, and providing guidance back to individuals. And we're actually applying this at Boston Children's, where we have an ability now to triage patients before they ever reach the ED, and actually do a pretty good job in terms of diagnostic uh, uh, accuracy. So what we're able to do now is really funnel the right people to the right 
area of care, whether it's self-treat at home, go to urgent care, or actually do come into the emergency department. And you can imagine the opportunities at, at scale when you start to make these algorithms available, especially in resource-poor settings. I'll just close with the fact that we probably should also be thinking about opportunities beyond just text and imaging. I'm sure the majority of people in this room have some form of listening device, whether it's an Alexa or Google Home. The opportunities in healthcare are pretty amazing as these kind of passively collecting de uh, devices are understanding things like tone and volume and pitch. The underlying healthcare implications are pretty significant. And so we're going to see a massive shift in the kinds of data we're thinking about for this particular domain. So I'll leave it there and open up to any questions. Thank you. Are, are there parts of the world that you've seen there being a less of an activation energy or a bump to integrate the uh, public source data and some of the more institutional source data? Yeah. Um, I would say probably like places we've seen are like Southeast Asia, Thailand. There's been a huge push to recognize the value of participatory surveillance, social media information, and the, you know, the ability to use that information to extend what healthcare can do today, especially when you think about One Health opportunities and the impact of, of animal disease, the, the recognition that you need these sort of non-traditional sources to support the full view of healthcare. Um, yeah, we're seeing, we're seeing major leaps happening there well, well beyond what we're seeing here in the U.S. So I found this inspiring, but I want to channel somebody who would find this presentation terrifying in the following way, right? Uh, essentially, you know, you're saying let's not use clinical data. Clinical data, at least, we have well-controlled, well-established privacy rules, ownership rules, legal rules. Let's instead go out into the wild and all this other data that's being generated by people, and let's use that for what we're going to call participatory surveillance. Of course, the participatory nature is for those who decide to share the data, but the inferences that are made includes those who do not share their data, and that kind of inferences are not particularly protected by a regime of anti-discrimination norms and the like. Yeah. So aren't you concerned about the weaponization of this in a way that we would not like? Yeah, that's great. And that probably is worth a whole hour discussion. Um, we think very clearly about the bias that exists in the data. Of course, there's a, sh you know, there's a recognition that there's a subset of people that are willing to share this kind of information and be actively part of it. We think about that population and we compare that to the population more broadly. I mean, we have a pretty deep insight, for instance, on the flu near system of who are these people that are reporting and how do they have a full representation of our population or not? Um, and we make adjustments for that bias. But I think there's definitely, you know, you s s talk about weaponization. <laughs> there's definitely uh, other opportunities to get insights about what people are doing through also the same type of mining. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's definitely something to consider. Also, just to make, make a point, we're not necessarily saying that this is a replacement of clinical data. It's an enhancement. We working closely um, you know, with Zach, who's in the audience here, on this idea that it's not about this data alone. It's about the combination of your digital phenotype with your clinical data. That represents the best potential insights. And I think that's really where we're striving to, rather than trying to utilize this data in a bubble. <laughs>